Uh, we can't see your head, though. You see, you're too low. That's what I kept saying. Y'all need to stand up where you can be seen. Shiny, look at the camera. Moto, moto, moto. You've covered me with hair. What else can you do? Don't, let's see my hand up here. Look. Come here. Oh, there you go. Stand up. Look up here. Look up there to the camera. See, there's the microphone here. Talking to the mic. You have a pretty voice. Talking to the mic. Right there. Oh, you see, that's my glasses. Yep. Are you going to stand up? No, you guys are not standing up. Y'all are getting comfortable and laying down. This is bad. <laughs> oh, you guys are so much fun. Okay. Well, uh, I need to... <laughs> I need to do something, okay? It's it's the night before Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day weekend. And I have been instructed. Look at you cute little faces. Yes, I know what it is. It's not no look up there. Yes. And my wife has instructed me to do this show early. Right? That's what mommy said. I have to do this show early so that I can spend some time with her to, this evening on Saturday night. So I'm gonna be aided by my two new uh, production managers okay and that's Moto and Shiny and they are going to be helping us do the show uh, faster and better right is that why y'all have been hired and everyone else has been fired is that right yep what do you say Moto uh-huh Shiny Shiny yeah who's your poppy no, that's not sexual harassment. Yes, I know this is a production, but you are actually... I, I am your poppy. <laughs> so, so, yes, I can say that, okay? Yes, you're in charge on the set. That's true, you're in charge. So I apologize, that was disrespectful because you, you are the production manager and I should treat you with respect. And Moto, you're the uh, director, yes? Okay, so... Uh, then what do we do now? Do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to shoot this early because we've got to do it? Do you want to go, you know, straight to film or, you know, what you, what, what do you, what are your thoughts on this here? Really? Okay. All right. So we should just record it. Uh, I got a question for you. Are you going to sit in my lap the whole time that I do the show? Not that I'm saying anything's wrong with that. I'm just, you know, trying to get your, your thoughts on this, you know. And uh, since you know you're you're the you're the director, you're in charge. No, it has nothing to do with you being a woman. I'm trying to give you respect. So, what is it that you want to do? No, I did not. I was not being disres I was not being disrespectful. That was not sexist. I was asking you, what do you want to do? Okay. Yes. All right. So, I will I will record the show just like I normally do, right? And then we can program it to to pro to to broadcast later on tonight. Okay. All right, well, should we get started? Okay, so I, I should uh, set everything up then? Okay, all right. Welcome. I like that because it sounds like the emperor has entered the room. <laughs> Welcome to adult story time with Lucian. 
Uh, it is earlier than normal. This is being pre-recorded because this is Saturday night, the night before Mother's Day, and my wife has informed me that I have to spend this evening with her. So she will be getting live, Lucian, uh, for story time tonight, and you guys will be getting a recording. Hey, I she's my wife. Happy wife. Happy life. <clears throat> I do what she says, okay? So we're recording early. Oh, let's see. Where are we? Okay, everything looks good. The recording is not a single drop frame. The recordings look good these days. Everything, the lighting, all the backgrounds, all this is good. I've got it down. So now we'll go to my reading setup. And that brings up everything the way it should. There's my new timer. Let me stop the old timer, reset it. We get ready to do the other one. All right, ready? Okay, I know you're ready. Where's my die? There it is. Remember what where we were? It doesn't matter if you remember. Okay, I'll back it up just a little bit. President John Smith heard the sound and stopped walking just before his foot crossed the painted red line and touched the surface of the black, sparkly material. The high-energy laser beams hit a few feet away from him on the beginning of the shallow hill made of special energy-absorbing concrete. It was actually the purpose of the high-tech moat, which now surrounded the entire perimeter of the once beautiful and exclusive country club golf course. That's where we stopped. Cool defense system, right? The lasers made a loud crackling noise as the nanomaterial absorbed the coherent light energy and redirected it as static electrical charge. As a thin cloud of smoke began to form above the sparks shooting out of the concrete, the normally invisible lasers formed a perfect X a short distance in front of the wide-eyed president's feet. The ground for 30 feet in all directions away from the twin laser impact zone was now electrified with enough static charge to disable the entire Miami police force. But JL's property wasn't actually in Miami. It was next to the university, which is in a Miami suburb called Coral Gables. But JL's research park wasn't in Coral Gables either. The property that now belonged to JL wasn't even in Florida, for that matter. Not legally. JL's research park was essentially its own little country inside the borders of the state of Florida. Shortly after J.L. struck it rich, he purchased the historic Biltmore Hotel and the attached golf course with its country club. Then he bought the golf course to the south of the Biltmore Hotel, the one that butted up against the University of Miami. Then he bought every single home that bordered the property on all sides. He had plenty of money and everyone has their price. Then... J.L. arranged for the governor and state legislator, legislature to give him the same deal that the Seminole Indians and other tribes around the country have. They were independent nations within the border of the continental United States, and they could make their own laws on their land. And you had to abide by those laws when you were on their land, which was the same thing as being in their country. This is how Indian reservations get to own and operate casinos in states where gambling is not legal. J.L. had the same arrangement with Florida, and he'd hired the best legal firm in the state to make sure that it was not revocable. Two former governors and about two dozen former state legislators, three congressional representatives, and both active U.S. senators were involved in the Rourke Group for the project. And that was just at the beginning. The group grew drastically as the idea was floated around Tallahassee and then Washington. People said he could never do it. But it happened, just like J.L. knew it would. He knew how these things worked. It was like playing chess, which he was extremely talented at. J.L. knew when to move a piece and when to leave a piece alone. He knew when to sacrifice a piece and which piece of his opponents to leave on the board. He also had an instinct for knowing when and how to eliminate anything he decided was interfering with his single-minded goal 
of beating his opponent. JL was to the business world what a young Tiger Woods was to the golf world. It was a high-tech, high-powered, high-stakes, high-finance, and head-of-state business world that JL now played and worked in every day. Real-life chess, as he liked to call it. And, in the spirit of the chess game of life, JL had jokingly elected himself king in his new tiny nation. Then he hired guards and started building and building. Meanwhile, the erstwhile enemy of JL, the president of the University of Miami, was no longer a threat of any sort to JL. Honestly, he never was. JL manipulated him almost at will, like right now. JL orchestrated this moment when he told his helicopter pilot to hover over one of the Farnsworth buildings on the main campus and stay there until the campus police showed up. He knew the president would lead the charge. JL had played this series of chess moves many times in his head, and it was working. JL saw the president jump backward as the lasers shot fire into the air about three feet in front of his $400 shoes. JL was waiting for this moment. He was laughing out loud when he keyed the megaphone again. Don't make me call the governor again, Dr. Smith. Just go back to your little office and wait until tonight. Then I'll program the laser sentries to let you on the property. Until then, remember my little oak tree over there. Then he lowered the megaphone and looked at the president, who was too far away for him to hear. From what JL could tell by the tantrum dance the university president was doing right now, he was still not ready to admit defeat. JL decided he should add something, and he thought for a moment. Then he keyed the megaphone again. And don't look at me that way. It's my helicopter. And the top floor of that building on your campus over there is mine, too. The DOD and DARPA gave it to me. No strings attached. Remember? If I want to fly over it, I can. I had the FAA send you that letter explaining my rights. I know you received it. I had it sent certified. Now get over it. Then JL turned and walked off. He handed the megaphone, megaphone to his limo driver and walked into the building in front of him. Finally, he started to talk to Marise again, who had been on the line the whole time. She started to hang up, but she got interested in the background drama. JL cleared his throat as he entered the air-conditioned building through the unlocked front door. Marise, sorry about that again. Domestic security problems, you know. You just can't trust your neighbors anymore. At least that's what I keep telling the governor about our mutual friend, President John Smith. That's who I thought you were yelling at. What the hell was that all about? JL started to answer, but she interrupted him. Never mind, I don't have time. I've already spent a fortune of my field budget on this damn phone, satellite phone today trying to reach you. Anyway, I've got a problem and I need you to solve it. Just like old times, straight to the point and no bullshit. That's what I like about you, Marty Say. JL, JL had quickly walked through the building and reached the console of a large computer terminal in the back of his enormous lab. He sat down at an overstuffed chair in front of the massive bank of monitors. They sprang to life as soon as his butt hit the seat. He started typing as he continued talking with Marty Say. And don't worry about the satellite bill. He tapped a few more keys on the panel in front of his chair. The billing information for Marise's satellite phone popped up. JL's computer was linked into his cell phone. The number she called from was highlighted above the information regarding the billing for the sat phone. At the bottom of the page was the outstanding balance of a few thousand dollars. He typed in a few more strokes and the balance owed in the bottom of the billing screen jumped to a positive $50,000 credit. I just paid this bill and put 50 grand in your satellite account. So let's chat and catch up, okay? You're one of the few people I'll talk to on the phone. Let me enjoy this. How the hell did you put money in my account? This phone is registered under the University of Mexico City. Easy. Caller ID and a few friends in high places. Besides, no one's account turns down getting money. He was smiling to himself as he clicked yes to the on-screen prompt to 
locate satellite signal and engage image assets? When he did, he initiated a string of events containing almost a trillion quantum micro-instructions spread over the entire set of global networks. Every computer on the planet that was actively connected to the internet, or any other network for that matter, instantly began to unknowingly parse single microbits of code distributed by quantum modulation fluctuation on both the electrical and the electronic pulse signals. Suddenly, the satellite control systems of four large corporations and six military spy satellites were queried in such a fast manner the security protocols did not recognize or register the entry. Once decisions were made regarding the feedback of the query, queries, which happened in nanoseconds, the return set of instructions was parsed over the world and hyper-rammed back into the systems in question in a shorter time span than an electrical spike in the gigahertz range. Three satellites in range and position were identified and their monitor control systems were then bombarded with inter internal command line requests for diagnostics. The systems started checking themselves and notifying ground stations of a temporary delay in response. All the ground stations thought this was normal, especially after a solar storm like today, as the systems were auto-forwarded into non-monitor guidance for the duration of the diagnostics. The lens array on each of the satellites secretly swung toward the Yucatan. Image sensors ramped up the couple charge that would send the super resolution data stream back down the diagnostic carrier wave. But the data would travel via a transcoded background static signal that was below the threshold of the sensitive receivers on the ground. From there, the data stream static pulsed across the backbone of the major networks on the North American continent. The signal traveled almost at the speed of light across the fast sections of the fiber optic spinal column of the North American data grid. Then, oops, lost it just a second. Then, all the unobservable and undetectable data stream nanopulses came together at one location. The main monitor in front of JL snapped an orbital view of the planet on screen. He began to rapidly zoom into the Yucatan Peninsula. It is almost impossible for anyone in any agency to swing satellites immediately into a random area of the globe. Even the Department of Defense birds, which are the most advanced spy satellites in the skies, have to be pre-positioned in the general area of interest before the orbital assets can image something. JL was able to get around this restriction in a unique way, and the computer in front of him was the reason why. In fact, his computer was so powerful there was only one other computer like it in the world, the little sister of this machine, which was now in classified residence at the NSA. His computer was the reason JL was able to do any of the things that he regularly did now, like play golf with presidents of countries not university presidents like the one he just left outside before talking to Marise, who suddenly spoke and snapped him back to the present. I don't believe you. Marise was not an idiot. You didn't put money in my account, did you? But she also knew how JL could be when it came to spending money. Oh, trust me, girl, the money's there. You can take that to the bank. <coughs> he snorted a little as he laughed at his own unintentional joke. Marise didn't know what to say. $50,000 was almost two and a half months of her field budget. She'd have to find a way to get that money out of the satellite phone and into her pyramid. But not right now. Right now she needed to get JL to listen and stop spending money. She had read enough of the gossip columns to know that might not be easy with the new JL. This JL was rich. He was something like the 13th wealthiest man on the planet now. But that didn't matter to Marty Say. JL, shut the fuck up. I need to ask you a question, and I don't have time for any of your mind games about your fortune or your friends or that silly pig snort of a laugh you still have. Comprende, mi amigo? She tried hard not to, but she cracked up laughing after she heard herself say this out loud. Out loud. So did J.L. He stopped taking her insults seriously a long time ago. At least she was straight with him. 
That's my girl. I was wondering if you'd mellowed over the years. Obviously not. You now have my undivided attention. What may I do for you, my long-lost roommate? As he was talking to her, the satellite image zoomed in to Marise talking on the satellite phone to JL. The shot was nearly overhead, and he could see her clearly. She was standing on a stone surface and had her University of Miami baseball cap on. She was still wearing the same sweaty tank top and her hiking shorts with boots. She was walking in circles, but suddenly stopped. First, I'm not that long. I'm the same age as you, and I'm not lost. I saw you a few years ago. Second, I told you. I just told you. I need your help. This actually got JL's attention. Marise had not asked for help. She told JL she needed him to solve a problem she had. The subtle difference was not lost on JL. You've never asked for help on anything or from anybody. This is serious, isn't it? Not serious, but I think it could be important. To more people than just me, too. While JL was listening, another satellite view popped onto the screen to the left of the central monitor. This satellite had an oblique angle of the same shot as it zoomed into the Yucatan and Marise's sat phone signal. He could see her face from this perspective. The image continued to zoom in until Marise's face filled the giant screen. JL touched the panel in front of him and the shot of her face switched onto the main screen while the overhead shot slid onto a side monitor. And that's the end of the timer. We will stop right there. Okay. Well, let's see. One button should take everything away. And it does. We'll stop that. And reset it. Okay. Can you hear the lawnmower going in the background? I told you I was recording this early. Okay, well, uh, it's Saturday. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. I'm probably not going to do a show, but I might. I may not. Probably not. I hadn't been doing Sundays. I've been doing all the other days, mostly. I only missed a couple. And I tried to make them up. But that's where we are. Hope you're enjoying these things. Uh, remember to... You can leave a comment. You can leave a review for the book. You can do you know whatever. Just drop by, say hello, you know, wave, that sort of thing. A couple of comments on YouTube have said hello, so hey, back. Just saying. <sighs> All right, well, that's it. I will see you guys on the next one. <laughs>